article. Um, and she will be doing the presentation today. And also we wanna share this opportunity with the District Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee for tonight's program. Um, Brian will be our host tonight. And I just wanted to say thank you everybody for joining in our club meeting. And I hope that you enjoy it. Thank you so much for the introduction, Marta. Thank you so much for welcoming us tonight. It's great to have your club hosting this. How appropriate for one of the most diverse clubs in our district. This is awesome, awesome. And a special thanks goes out to Lisa Harheloran. Sorry, Lisa. <laughs> no worries. The, the pressure, the pressure. Lisa does, she's our educator for the district and she does a phenomenal job of bringing this all together for us. So thank you so much, Lisa. She's the one that makes it happen. She'll be the person behind the, the curtain tonight, making sure everything goes well, smooth, so. Thanks for the pressure, Brian. We're all good, right? So right. good evening, everyone. As Brian said, I'm Lisa O'Halloran. I'm your district trainer. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening. Uh, She's outstanding. We are in for a real treat. Sam Maldonado is an agile organizational leader with proven success in creating strong cultures through transformational change, innovation, and measurable and scalable business results. She is a senior manager of diversity and inclusion for Kohl's. In addition to that, because that's not enough to do, in 2018, she and her husband started Pinpoint Solutions, providing services in advertising, branding, professional development and coaching, public speaking, diversity and inclusion training, and lean and change management methodology training. She serves on a number of boards in the greater Milwaukee area. Uh, she's also recognized by the Milwaukee Business Journal in 2018 as one of the 40 under 40. She's following a founding cohort of Forward 48 and a founding cohort for of form. She earned her business and management BA degree and master's in business administration at Alverno College. And in addition to that, she also co-owns a restaurant, Snifters and Tap Tapas and Spirits, with her husband and business partner in Milwaukee. So I am absolutely delighted to invite Sam to share with us tonight on overcoming unconscious bias. I will say uh, we are recording the session. So if you are concerned about appearing on camera, you are welcome to turn video off during the presentation. If you have questions, comments, by all means, add them in the chat. I will be monitoring that. And if you have questions as we're able, I will interject them into the presentation. And if we don't cover them all during presentation, we're holding 15 minutes at the end for Q&A. So without further ado, Brian, you can go ahead and fire up the PowerPoint and welcome Sam, delighted to have you. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. Um, such a relevant topic, right? Um, with so much going on in the world, sometimes it takes us a moment to take a pause and reflect and really think about our own self-awareness um, and really come to this sort of conversation discussion, really, because this is not me just talking at you while there's going to be some information that I'm providing. I really want you to take this opportunity to self-reflect and think about your own experiences, your conditioning, and I ask that you come with an open mind, open ears, open heart, because it takes all of us to move the needle forward in the right direction, to ensure that we're creating equitable opportunity, that we are creating an environment of inclusion, and that we're creating a space of sense of belonging for those that we work with, that we support with, and our leaders for. So a lot to do in the next hour or so, and I'm hopeful and I, um, that we'll get through it all, and I welcome your thoughts and questions. Um, and without further ado, we'll get started. So talking about unconscious bias, recognizing it in ourselves and overcoming unconscious bias in the workplace as well. So I will preface that every single person on this planet has bias. It's not a certain demographic. It's not a certain slice or you identify a certain way. You only have bias. It is inherent in every single one of us. So what we'll talk about this evening is understanding bias, where it comes from, how it happens, the implications of it where it's positive, where it has some negative adverse opportunities, reactions, and then what we can do differently to work through it with intention, okay? So if we wanna to go to the first slide or the, the slide that has all the faces on it, if you can see that. And so first off, I would ask you just to take a moment and scan all the different faces that you see before you. Could you, sorry, Samantha, yeah. could you 
resend that to me. It's not pulling up from my oh. uh, file. Thank you. Sure, no worries. Lisa, do you have it? Or do you want me to resend it all over? Which is fine. We'll do that real quick. Or Lisa, they can make Samantha co-host and then Samantha will be able to present. Sam is a co-host and I'm pulling up the presentation. If you want to see my face, I'm quite uh, red from embarrassment. <laughs> oh, good. Technology. Do we have it up now or? Not yet. It's getting it to share. Okay. It's a PDF, so but this will work. Yeah. This is no different than when you're doing a presentation in front of everybody and your computer decide not to work, so. Yeah. All about trusting the process, going with the flow, right? Perfect. Okay, are we seeing the presentation now? Yes. Perfect. Brian, we're swapping roles. Could you monitor chat, please? <laughs> because I can no longer see it. There we go. Okay, so here are the faces that I'm referencing. Is there a way that you can make it a little bit bigger, Lisa? We'll make do, we'll make, we'll find our way through. So I just ask you to take a few moments and look at these faces and what jumps out at you? What do you see? What is, are the, any of them favorable? Do they, are they kind of um, draw you in or any kind of giving you an adverse or unfavorable reaction? Are there any that you have a positive association with or potentially negative association with? And I want you just to sit with that for a moment and reflect on where do those feelings come from? Are there, you know, certain things that you gravitate towards or not? And we don't have to go and do a share back right now, but I just want you to think about what's really, what are you connecting with? Okay. Because any single one of these individuals can self-identify as an entrepreneur, as a mom, as a dad, as a partner, you know, as a leader beyond just what we see at face value. And so that's where we can start to recognize and reflect on the bias that we may have that's layering onto the story that we're adding to the individual based on solely a picture that we're looking at. Okay. So if you want to go to the next slide, whenever we're learning a new skill, there's four stages of competence that we're going through, right? Their fir the first step is unconscious incompetence. And this is, you just don't know what you don't know, right? When you're starting a new job, when you get a promotion, when you're moving to a new city, you don't know where to go. You don't know what questions to ask. It's a totally new domain, totally new territory to learn. And that's okay, that's expected, right? The thing is though, once you start to become more aware, once you start to ask more questions and know more information, now it's a matter of, putting it into practice, applying those learnings so that you are now consciously incompetent, right? You, don't, you now know that you just don't know. So now you have that door open, that window open, that there is more to learn, that there's more to understand, more to consider as you're making your way through decisions, as you're making your way through engagement and inclusion, as you're making your way through asking different questions. And so then we transform more so in, by continuing to practice to conscious competence, which is you know that you know, right? There's more that you can apply. You're putting it into practice and it's starting to become a little bit more effective, right? You have to put some effort into it, but you, you have a better handle. You have a better understanding of what you're working with. And then you move into habit formation by applying those learnings to become unconscious competent or competence, 
where you don't have to think about it overtly anymore, right? You just, you don't know that, you know, it's just, it's second nature. It's muscle memory, right? It's, it's just part of what you do every day where we can think about this is just a secondhand habit. And so anytime you learn something new, this is the, the cycle of engagement or the cycle of competence in the learning that you're undergoing, that you're doing. And that happens with anyone and everyone, right? So if you think about in an example of financial services and you want to engage, let's say in the Asian American market, you don't know what you don't know about that market until you start making and doing your research, making those connections. And as you continue to make a name for yourself in that market and you say, hey, I wanna to continue to focus then on the women market. You have to start again, potentially, and the unconscious incompetence and, and start again and saying, what don't I know? And start to make your, make your way through that engagement as well. So you can be in multiple places at the same time, but it's a matter of how you are intentionally moving through this quadrant, this cycle of learning as you're engaging in new territory, new skills, and new behaviors. Okay. So moving on, we can then talk about unconscious bias versus implicit bias. So unconscious bias refers to a bias that we are unaware of, it's subconscious, and which happens outside of our own control. Whereas implicit bias refers to the same, but questions the level to which these biases are truly unconscious, especially as we're being made increasingly aware of them, right? So I always think about the quote from Maya Angelou, like, once you know better, you do better, right? I teach this to my kids all the time, like I start the phrase, they finish it. And so it's a matter of once you know that this is a bias that you hold, do you choose to move through it with intention of maintaining said bias if it has a, posi a, po a possible adverse effect? Or do you still, you know, or do you try to maintain it differently or try to change it differently, right? So holding an implicit bias towards a particular social group can determine how you treat an individual from that group, right? So if we think about in the workplace, identical resumes receive different number of callbacks depending on the name of the top of the document, potentially, right? You can have Joseph versus Jose, right? You, there've been studies done many times about Joseph getting the callback and Jose not. There is actually um, an example, a friend of mine had called a realtor twice, one by his um, ethnic sounding first name and then one by his more um, Christian Caucasian sounding name. Same exact message, leave, leaving two different names though, right? Which one do you think got the call back? <laughs> as, I, I was a, as I would assume many of you may have thought the more Caucasian sounding name got the call back, not the more ethnic name, right? And so this was a potential opportunity for someone securing the lead for making a sale um, but because of a bias, they never got a call back or they got a call back, you know, but then, you know, the test had been done and, and um, I doubt that they'll pursue that opportunity. So it's, it's not that bias is something that we unlearn. It's a matter of how do we choose to move through it differently with intention. Okay. Okay. We can move forward. So as we think about implicit bias versus explicit bias, they are related concepts and they also are related to racism, right? So if you think about a prejudice that we have or a bias that we have that can lead to prejudice, that leads to racism, that leads to oppression, right? There's a systematic cumulative growth potential to just a simple thought about how we engage or interact with something or someone, right? And so it's not that we need to unlearn, but we need to acknowledge. We need to raise awareness and be thoughtful to learn the difference between conscious and intentional versus unconscious and unintentional and to act with better connectedness and to think about how you choose to show up and why, right? We all have different conditioning, right? Based on where we grew up, our family structure, our religion, you know, our affluence, lack of affluence and opportunity, all of those different components affect our puzzle of what makes us who we are. And now it's a matter of choosing once we learn if we have a certain bias or not, how does that affect our decision making? Okay. So as we think about, we're going to stay here. So as we think about explicit bias versus implicit, again, explicit bias is expressed directly, overtly. You are aware of said bias. 
it operates consciously. So an example could be, again, I like whites more than Latinos, just as an example, right? Whereas an implicit bias, right? It's not necessarily as overt, but it's expressed indirectly, more subtly, that you're unaware of said bias. It operates, operates subconsciously. So an action or um, example could be, you're sitting further away from a Latino than a white individual. Or when someone enters the room, you move to the other side of the room, right? Or you, you hold your bag a little bit closer when someone of a different demographic enters the room or to the store, right? Those are different ways of how bias can play out. And you may not even overtly think about it. You just kind of do it. But it's something that you're conditioned in to operate with. And so it's now becoming more aware and choosing to become more aware of our implicit biases and actively resisting them. We can then avoid perpetually harmful racist stereotypes and prejudices. And so some things I also want to um, lend into this content is regarding microaggressions. And I'm sure we may have all heard of microaggressions. Microaggressions stem from prejudice. It's an act of discrimination. So microaggression is a term used for brief and commonplace daily verbal, behavioral, or environmental indignities, whether intentional or unintentional, but it communicates hostile, derogatory, and or negative prejudicial slights and insults toward any group. Whereas micro assaults, there are subcategories, <laughs> more than I learned, right? Micro assaults are conscious and intentional actions or slurs, such as using racial epithets, displaying swastikas, or deliberately serving a white person before a person of color in a restaurant. Whereas micro insults, are verbal and nonverbal communications that subtly convey rudeness and insensitivity and demean a person's racial heritage or identity. So an example is an employee who asks a colleague of color how she got her job, implying that she may have landed it through affirmative action or um, uh, other reasons than merit or performance-based, okay? We also have micro invalidations which are communications that subtly exclude, negate, or nullify the thoughts, feelings, or experiential reality of a person of color, right? So for instance, white people often ask Asian Americans where they were born, conveying the message that they are perpetual foreigners and that they don't belong, right? I mean, personally, I mean, my maiden name is Polish because my dad is German Polish. My mom is from Peru. And a lot of times when my, when before I was married and my Polish name would be on my name tag, a lot of people would be like, where are you from? Tell me more about you, right? And it never, I wouldn't say there was ever like a negative intent or malice, but it was because they chose that as a lead in to introduce themselves to ask about me. It felt more of a, of an other or an us versus them situation versus me having been born and raised here, right? And so, if you ever are called out for a microaggression, think about how you are choosing to respond and choose to respond with compassion, right? This is a learning opportunity. This is not meant to, you have to know every single answer, right? You're learning, you're starting to learn more about this. You're unconsciously incompetent. And then once you know more, then you are consciously incompetent. And so this is the opportunity. This is the first step or step two or three in your learning journey, in your capacity to learn to consider and broaden that aperture of consideration in regards to the potential trauma and or experience of others around you, right? And, it, and I say that to be, it's not like just people of color have trauma. That is not the case. Every single person deals with trauma in, any, any, in, any, in many different ways. But it's again, you, you've seen that you never know what people are dealing with at face value, right? On social media, a lot of people always put the nice shiny thing out there for the world to see, but not the whole story. And so I say that to be, give, give people and yourself some space and some grace as you are engaging in this new territory for yourself, as you are considering your reflection and self-awareness and that of others and meeting them where they are and asking them to meet them, have them meet you where you are, but being open to reflect and have some self-awareness with that. And so if you are ever approached and, and having said a microaggression or micro insult or invalidation or had um, overtly communicated a bias, just say, thank you for sharing that feedback, right? There's no need to become defensive, just say thank you, right? 
I may be not going to use that word in the future. You know, keep your responses short, non-defensive, but seek to understand in your own time. All right, take some moment to kind of digest that, internalize it, ask for some feedback. And it really is, again, starting back on that competency framework. Where am I in my learning journey? And that allows you also then to recognize where others are on their learning journey as well. Okay, so we can go to the next slide, please. So where does bias really come from, right? The age old question. And I will say it's from our brain, <laughs> right? Like I said before, it's the conditioning, it's the experiences, but where do our attitudes and beliefs come from? It's through all of those experiences from birth through now, right? And the brain is a great thing, but it also can get us into some trouble. So they're amazing, but they can also provide us some difficulty. So problem one is we get too much information, too much data, too much stimulus throughout the course of the day, right? We don't have enough meaning with every single piece of stimuli that we receive. We sometimes need to act fast. There's so much coming at us, so many decisions and so much to process throughout the course of the day. And then what do we need to remember? What's important? What's kind of like a passing by that we need to process or what's really most important? You know, what's that, that um, burning platform, that fire that we need to address versus, you know, something that kind of falls to the wayside with which I'll deal with later. So the thing is we have over information overload. So we become aggressively filtered you know, throughout the course of the day, noise becomes a signal. What's the shiny thing that I need or the squeaky wheel I need to deal with right then and there. And so it's, we think about the brain in two different ways. And 95% of the time, our brain reacts to just impulse or emotional reaction, right? It just, it works off pattern. You know, it's, it's a fight or flight um, uh, tactic, really. You know, when, when in Cro-Magnon times or caveman times, you had to, if there's a, a twig that, you know, broke, we have to react super quick. We didn't have time to sit there. Was it something that's a fatal, you know, fatal attack or is it just, a, you know, a bunny? But we really have to think about what is causing these, our reactions, what's causing us to create these stories. And sometimes we, we don't have a lot of time to think and we just impulsively react and our emotions can take the better of us. There's also a lack of meaning, which can be confusing. So we fill in the gaps based on what we think makes sense, our own sense of reality, our sense of control, based again on our conditioning, based on the experiences that we've had. And so sometimes we jump to conclusions or we make inferences based on the information at hand. And then those stories become decisions. And then of course, it's not getting easier. The world seems like it's getting smaller and more connected all the time. So we try to remember the important bits. What's most important that you need to remember just to get to next tomorrow. So decisions inform a mental models of the world. So as I was saying, like 95% of the time we have the quick impulse reaction that we do just to get throughout the course of the day. Whereas of the other 5% is where we need to really slow down and think about how we're choosing to respond, not just react, but respond with thoughtful intention, decision-making. So like after a long test or after a long hard day, we really had to apply some thinking You're like my brain hurts. That's because <laughs> we don't use that part of our brain or we don't slow down to think that hard very often. And so that's where we need to start changing some of those behaviors and some of those patterns of behavior and act with more intention about slowing down our thinking and making better responsive decisions versus just reactions. Okay. Okay, we can go to the next slide, please. So when we think about bias, there are about a list of 10 that are pretty much the key, the key list to think about, okay? We have the halo effect, and the halo effect really is what you would assume it to be. It's the tendency for positive impressions of a person to reflect positively or to influence judgments and opinions in other ways, putting them on a pedestal. They can do no wrong, right? We have the horn effect which is the contrary to the halo, but that the perception of an individual to be in unfairly influenced by a single negative trait or past experience. And in, in corporate, I've heard this um, term to refer to as the tin can, right? They've done bad something once and it forever is connected to them, right? Or you have an affinity or a similarity bias 
to connect with others who share similar backgrounds, experiences, and interests, right? And I also add, bias is not always a bad thing, like I've said before, but it's how does that bias play out? Does it exclude others with intention to create like a sense of belonging versus not? Is it, you know, you like the Packers and you have that sense of affinity, great, but do you do so at the expense of others, right? Whereas you have the confirmation bias, where favoring or choosing information which fits in with one's pre-existing beliefs, okay? We see a lot of this in the news sometimes where I have a certain feeling, oh, that other person said it, yep, we're confirmed, we're good, that's what I'm going to believe, right? So it, it depends on how, again, more information to make the best informed decision will help to make better lasting responses versus just reactions. Attribution bias, <coughs> excuse me, is something, when something good happens to us, we believe that it is all of our doing. We were in control, we made it happen. But when something bad happens, well, that's the, that's the opposite. I had no control. It was out of my control. You know, um, we assume that, you know, it's luck or we blame external factors, right? But if it's somebody else, if something bad happens to somebody else, it's their fault, right? They didn't do it, you know, or when, when it's, um, oh, I got that backwards, sorry. So when something bad, <laughs> I apologize, when something bad happens to somebody else, it was because it was something that they did, right? They were in control, it's their fault. Where something, if something lucky happened to them, if something positive happened, then it was just luck, right? So it's the adverse between what, how we see ourselves and how we see others in regards to that attribution, okay? For gender bias, again, the tendency to prefer one gender over another, pretty straightforward. You have contrast bias to promote or demote an item after a single comparison with another item in the group, right? If you like a certain type of ketchup or a certain type of cleanser, right? You're like, that's the one I'm going over after every time. Um, anchoring to rely too heavily on one trait or piece of information, okay? Conformity, which is kind of like the godfather of all bias, is to behave similarly to other members in a group. And name bias, I kind of touched on this one earlier, is a preference for someone based on their name, which positively reflects on decision-making and judgments subsequently. And I also saw one in the chat real quick when it popped up regarding age bias, and that's very true. Right. And that's kind of an affinity and or confirmation. There's it can be a, a bunch of them. Right. You're part of a, a certain group or you're excluded from a certain group, your sense of belonging or not. You know, so a lot of these can play out in different ways. And a lot of them, we may not see them as overtly because they've just become commonplace or part of the culture. And that's when when we start to understand what these are, what these look like, how these play out, that you can call them out and speak up about them for yourself and for others right? Okay, so we can move on to the next one. And so here's a funny little comic, <laughs> I thought, to share on how confirmation bias can play out. Um, and so we can read it right here. So let's begin the meeting, but be aware that I'm documenting all of your bullying behavior right before the, even, the meeting even starts. And then he says, um, I'm not even close to being a bully, but now your confirmation bias will make everything I say sound like bullying to you. And then she responds with, well, can you repeat the part after you implied that I'm a delusional witch? So again, that's a filter, that's a bias through which everything she hears him say just reaffirms and, re and then confirms her initial filter that she sees him as a bullying, as a bully and his bullying behavior um, against her, right? So, and then we can go to the next one for gender bias. And this has actually happened to me <laughs> in real life and saying, well, that's an excellent suggestion, Ms. Triggs. Perhaps one of the men here would like to make it, right? Well, in, act in, in my experience, it didn't actually play out like that, but I had come up with a suggestion and then someone on the table, a man had said practically the same exact thing. And then he was the one called on to further expound on the idea. And I'm like, wait, what? I, I just said that. But so in that situation, what we can do is have leaders speak up and saying, oh no, Sam said something just like that a moment ago. Can, Sam, can you, can you explain further what your thoughts are? Or have peers in the room kind of 
be piqued to this opportunity saying, hey, Sam, what was your thought? And Kyle, can you build on it? But not letting the moment pass by. And that's important to not, to not let it just perpetuate and just become part of the everyday culture because that's when people start to tune out. That's when people start to feel excluded that their voice is not considered nor valuable. And that's when things start to, when people start to burn out and people, and then when you have those people that become um, indifferent, that's when, that's when you can start to be concerned about that talent considering leaving or finding alternate means of engaging. Okay. So here, if we're gonna to go to the next slide, we have um, a visual for conformity bias and it's subtle, but you can see in the two different slides, the first one, you have the girls sitting on the steps. They're all kind of dressed similarly, you know, striped shirts, jeans, and they're all in a little group. And then you have the girl walking by, you know, dressed in gear that she's comfortable with that makes her happy, but she sees that they're not even acknowledging her. But then in the next slide, the next day, I assume, She's now dressing like them and now they acknowledge her. Now they welcome her into the group and say hello, right? So it's the little things like that of like, oh, I wanna belong or oh, I wanna be seen. I need to change who I am to be seen so that I can conform, so that I'm part of that group of belonging. And we all have a, a unique need and thrive to wanna feel like we belong. We have a community, we have a culture that we feel we can show up in we feel supported. But if it's if it's if you're changing who you are to conform, then you're not being your unique self and, and finding that group that allows you to be who you are and finding that sense of belonging, in my mind, the right way, but just finding a group to belong and losing some of yourself in that process. Okay. If we want to go to the next one. So how does bias play out in the workplace? There are a few. <laughs> As I was kind of alluding to earlier, it affects our decision-making, right? If we only have so much time to make a decision, we kind of just do a gut reaction to what we think is the, you know, is the best at the moment, right? And I, I'm all about MVPs and minimal viable product, make the best decision with the information you have, but it's a matter of making informed decisions, not just relying on patterns or knee-jerk reactions, right? Sometimes we make inaccurate assessments when we make when we make biased decisions of who's the best fit for a certain role based on a certain demographic or where the or where the project is located, right? We make emotional decisions where we're not necessarily always logical or or, or calm or balanced in our thinking, and that can negatively affect our decisions sometimes, right? How many times have we made decisions when we're emotional? and we're not thinking clearly, and we're like, oh, wait, <laughs> that's not how I wanted to respond. And a lot of times that reaction was not how we wanted to behave or be seen or, or, or have be that lasting memory of our decision, right? Our attention, aspects of a person we pay most attention to, right? Is it they're more boisterous or they're more reserved? Do we have an inclination to um, connect with someone that's more boisterous? Or do we, do we overtly pull on someone and say, hey, what is your thought in a meeting when they're more reserved? But that could be actually part of their culture that they're waiting for the leader to stop speaking before they provide their thoughts, right? So there's always a nuance there, but it's knowing how to read the room and not necessarily saying, well, I'm loud, I like to be in charge, I like to be the center of attention, so everyone may like to be that way. That's not always the case, right? We have to understand where people are coming from, their experiences, their cultural um, uh, background and understand the implications of that. We need to be culturally competent and have some humility that not everyone's experience is your own or vice versa, right? Um, our listening skills, how much we actively listen to what certain people say. And it's not necessarily just being an active listener, but also being a skilled listener and not necessarily just waiting for someone to stop speaking before you can respond or react, but thinking, am I hearing them accurately? How do I paraphrase what I heard? How do I find support in what they're looking for? But it's again, being that counterpart to the other part of the discussion which is just receiving that, that the, 
what the person is saying. Sometimes there's a fear of threat and how the bias plays out, right? We have cognition overload. Our perceptions, how we see people and perceive reality are all based on our sense of reality and our experiences. Our attitudes, how we react towards certain people, right? Do, do we slink back or do we push harder based on a certain you know, characteristic of individuals? Do, um, you know, if you're taller or shorter, if you have a certain darker complexion or lighter, how are you received or how do you respond to others based on how others are, are showing up, right? Our behaviors, how receptive or friendly we are towards certain people. Do they look like us and we're a little bit more amicable or are we a little bit more reserved, right? And micro affirmations, how much or how little do we comfort certain people in certain situations, right? And then time. How much time, treasure, and talent can be lost because of a bias playing out ineffectively and adversely in the workplace, right? How much time does it take to hire someone? How does it time to take to train someone to build that rapport and that trust so that you have a strong sense of team, and not just team by title, but team that actually is focused on a shared sense of accomplishment and success? Right. And so if we let these little knee jerk reactions make these decisions for us because of a perceived bias, yes, that it it tears the team apart. And you don't know how to change the status quo effectively if you don't speak up. Right. And if you don't share opportunities for learning and saying, hey, I saw this. How do we trust it differently? Or, hey, this is what happened to me. What can we do differently? Right. So it really is about thinking about more inclusive beyond yourself, those that you work with, those that you serve, and those that you come in contact with. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So what are some ways to overcome bias in the workplace? So I'm gonna go through the previous 10 list and one by one. So for the halo effect, we can consider the candidate without that one gleaming attribute, right there, one thing that puts them on the pedestal. If we were to remove that, what does the rest of their profile or their resume look like, right? Is it pretty clear and cut to the somewhat another candidate or are they still heads and above or you know, underachieving beyond that one gleaming characteristic or component? For the horn effect, same idea. Take that one tin can, <laughs> that one piece where there's that negative gut feeling coming from, remove that and then how do they stack up against your other candidates or your other performers, right? For the affinity bias, actively take note of the similarities that you share. Differentiate between attributes that may cloud your judgment, right? And then contribute to your team as a culture add rather than just a culture fit. Because having a culture fit is just the same as what you've had, right? And that's, it's worked, it's served your purpose, but how do you create improved relevance? How do you create innovation and new thinking and challenging the status quo to, con to broaden um, engagement? And to think, even if it's not in a corporate environment, but even in, in a volunteer organization, in, a, in um, a nonprofit, you know, serving in a school, how do we think about how really serving those children? How do we continue thinking about fundraising or capital campaigns differently if, certain biases are still playing out. You're not able to get out beyond that sort of sense of thinking. For confirmation bias, important to ask standardized skills-based questions that provide each candidate with a fair chance to stand out, right? So there's consistency in the experience, right? You can always nuance and dig a little deeper, but you want consistency of experience so that you're not letting that bias play out and you're providing that um, equitable opportunity for each candidate. Attribution, something on the resume or someone said something that kind of just threw you off a little, ask for their clarifying questions. Give them a chance to share their full story before you draw any conclusions or have any certain rash um, reactions. So always trying to go in for more of that story, dig a little deeper, understand what the nuance is. If it's a culture relation, if it's a certain conditioning from their upbringing, right? That's in contrast to yours. And that's good because sometimes you want that healthy conflict to prompt a different way of thinking versus always getting more of the same. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Oh, one, one two, four. <laughs> we have then conformity bias. I think you went a little bit too far. 
Yep. Um, for toxic effect, you have toxic positivity sometimes where everyone's just so happy and so pleasant, but you never actually push through that and affect positive change, more transformational change, right? Sometimes you could call it Midwest nice. And I appreciate everyone being kind, but sometimes when you need to affect change or really have a, a coming to the table moment of we need to look at this differently, where are we, where are we strong? Where do we need me to make um, positive change or where we were coming up short? You need to call it out. And if if the bias is just to always be nice or have that toxic positivity, change will not happen or happen much, much more slowly. And people, again, will then burn out. They'll get frustrated and they will go elsewhere for, for need of urgency of action, right? Um, so for conformity bias, after the interview as a situation, you can all write down your thoughts, your, your ideas, your, your notes on that candidate and submit your individual opinions separately, right? So you don't necessarily have one person taking over or dominating the conversation. You can then come together and review what everyone wrote down. So you have an impartial opinions. You have your contrast bias, most common type of bias in the recruiting industry where you create structured applicant review and interview process, right? It's the same standard operating procedure, standard work, if you're thinking about lean. Compare applications and interview answers as apples to apples rather than apples to pears. Gender bias, you know, conduct blind screenings of applications, set diversity hiring goals, not just representational goals, and compare candidates based on skill and merit. And so one example you may have read or heard of is in the symphony, right? Where you had a predominance of, a, of the male gender in the symphony for many, 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 many years. And they're saying, hey, what's going on? We know there are very talented women musicians out there. Why don't we have more of a balance or more of an equitable slate of candidates coming through to perform and to apply? And so you then they learn to do the performance or the um, the, yeah, the application performance behind a screen. So you just hear the music. So the bias of seeing who's performing doesn't allow that filter to negate who's gonna be considered for next. And even having women remove any heels, right? Their shoes, because then that would give it away that it's a woman because you hear the tick, 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 tick on the floor. And again, that'll give away potentially that it's a woman performing and then that bias you know, could play out that way. So if you just really level the playing field of just hearing the music as it is, you would then see that there was a more of an equitable balance um, within the symphony after that um, tactic was played out, right? And then for the name bias, omit the candidate's name and personal information. Again, so you're just looking at it for what it is, okay? So some real world examples of unconscious bias. So how many of you have used YouTube before? Probably watched a video, maybe even uploaded one. A lot of time, and then the thing though about YouTube is interestingly enough, the engineers that had created the platform for it were all right-handed or they designed it for right-handedness. So for those that were left-handed, five to about five to 10% of the videos were uploaded upside down. And Google couldn't understand why, YouTube and Google couldn't understand why, because it was such a large percentage of the people that were shooting their videos were right-handed that that's where the bias played out. So the Google engineers had inadvertently designed the app for right-handed people. They never considered the fact that phones are usually rotated 180 degrees when held in a user's left hand. So that then constituted for the videos uploading backwards or, you know, not backwards, but upside down or, you know, um, not correctly based on what the bias was for those that had created the platform. Or what about this candidate sounds great, right? Well, resumes are a consistent source of unconscious bias. Resumes with like an Anglo sounding name receive substantially more callbacks, like I had said before, than those with diverse name origins names and their associated biases that impacted the decisions instead of the qualifications and value they could bring to the company. And also looking at activities, right? Did they play a sport that you played in college? Did they play a sport that's predominantly associated with maybe an Ivy League school, rugby versus, 
I don't know, tennis versus what have you. I'm just pulling something out of the air. But again, it's how are you relating to this candidate beyond just the merit, but how are you connecting as an affinity with this person, right? Or she's not great with computers. This has a lot of bias in the one little, one little statement, right? There are many times when a manager and employee will frame their unconscious bias as common sense. You know, there could be ageism in here. There could be gender issues in here. There could be a technology bias in here, right? Generational, all of it, right? But just because if she's a woman, is she not good with computers? Is it her age that's not good with computers? Is it where she lives? They don't have access to technology or they didn't have that, you know, the, the schooling for it. There's a lot of it just in that one sentence of how you can impact that so much and how bias can play out. Or you remind me of someone I know is really an affinity bias. The feelings and opinions you associate with another person can easily influence the way you see someone else. And a lot of times too, we can see this play out even within fundraising, right? Like, oh, you know, Joe asked me to donate to X organization. So I'll do it because I, I have an affinity with Joe, right? And sometimes it works out great. And other times we can make decisions that don't serve us or the other person well because it's playing out negatively potentially. Or here's the last one. This one's a little bit headier. He speaks the language. So I'll, the, the case in point is, let's say, a manager has a high profile urban project that needs a qualified project manager to get the job done and uses common sense to select an African-American project manager. When asked about the decision, the manager states that his choice is a great fit and speaks the language. Well, it's not overtly racist. It's simply an assumption that because this person is African-American, he must be more familiar with the urban environment and the issues the community faces. So positive intent, I understand. The reality may be that this African-American project manager grew up in the suburbs, went to private school, played polo, and has had no experience living in an urban community whatsoever. He may or, not, he may or may not have been the best project manager for the job, but the choice could have easily been based on an invalid assumption completely unrelated to the requirements of the project. These simple examples demonstrate how easily unconscious bias can creep into your business, shape daily decisions, and impact your company and your resources. And recognizing its influence is key to making objective decisions and avoiding these common mistakes. Okay, so we can go to the next one. So for the seeds model, this is very much similar to what I had explained before in the different types of bias. These are just organized into five different key categories. It's an alternative way of mitigating bias. It identifies processes. It interrupts and redirects unconsciously biased thinking and simplifies the roughly 150 identified cognitive biases into five key categories, like I said, okay? So we wanna to go to the next slide. This is really where the seeds model and bias play out. So you have similarities. So people like me are better. You have expedience. If it feels familiar and easy, it must be true. You have experience or my perceptions are accurate. You have distance. Closer is better than distance. So if you're closer to me, I have more of affinity of working with you versus if you're farther away, kind of out of sight, out of mind, right? And for safety, bad is stronger than good, the protector. So these are different ways of how our biases can play out similar to kind of the list of 10 that I provided you earlier. Okay, we can go to the next one. So why is it hard to move through bias? So a lot of times, again, it goes back to the fight or flight, kind of the, the lizard brain that we have from many, many years ago, right? That really doesn't serve us much anymore in some regard, but it's a resistance to our own susceptibility added to unconscious nature of cognitive bias that brings us to that bias is then continuously perpetuated and rarely recognized or adequately managed, right? So if it feels good to be right, it activates our reward system in our brain and in the circuitry and we're associated with contentment and certainty, right? We're good, I know it, I'm right, we're good to go, let's move on, right? Whereas if it feels like we did something wrong, we're on the defensive, we feel bad right? It's associated with pain and negative emotions, right? We are othered. We are out of the group. We're going to, we're going to 
die because we're not going to be part of the food source or the hunting group, right? It's, a, it's the fight or flight. I have to belong to survive. Even when there are no actual fatal <laughs> repercussions that are going to happen, there's no material consequence, right? If we get a bad email and we get like that little tinge of contention or conflict, it can change our emotions so quickly because it goes back to that lizard brain that's still wired that we have to deal with, right? And so it's a matter of why do I feel bad? Did I really do something wrong? Is this going to be really an adverse reaction to my life? Are the columns gonna crumble? Or is this really just a learning opportunity? I didn't know, and now I know, and how do I do better next time, right? And it's giving again yourself some space and grace to move through that, okay? And so we can go to the next slide, please. We'll talk about a ladder of inference scenario. So we may have all seen this or experienced it in one way, shape or form. The ladder of inference is we take a word or an experience or a situation and we relate it to our sense of reality or we infer what our story is from it, right? So here is another scenario to think through. Years ago, my boyfriend was over for dinner one night. My mother served pie for dessert. He called the pie interesting and my mother was offended. My dad snickered and I was mortified. He would say anything other than a glowing compliment. The word interesting in and of itself is not a negative or positive word. It just means causing interest or fascination. However, in the context of describing the flavor of a homemade pie, my family immediately took this comment to mean that he didn't like it. We all gave the same meaning to his use of interesting as a moderately polite way of saying he didn't like the pie. Then we each made our own assumptions, drew conclusions, and reacted based on our own beliefs all in an instant, right? So if we look at the comic, he called my pie interesting. He doesn't think my food is any good, is the, is the reaction. Or my boyfriend called my mom's pie interesting. Mom is proud of her food. She will be mad. Or my goodness, he said the word interesting she will not like his reaction, right? And so he may have had like, oh, it's interesting. These are new flavors. I never had plum and cinnamon and orange. I don't know, right? It could have been a new combo for him and that was interesting, but everyone else inferred that it had a negative connotation to it. This ladder of influence played out in a moment based on their sense of reality. So if you wanna to go to the next slide. The ladder of inference is something that we all do every single moment of the day. <laughs> this is how we, again, process so much data and stimulus throughout the course of the day for us to make decisions and move through our day by kind of moving through patterns, right? And, and putting everything in a quick little nice little box that we can understand and then move on. So we think about just a snapshot, just a photo. What do you see in a photo, right? You can't understand the story behind it potentially, but you can just see exactly what's in the photo. And so you think about um, just what you observe, right? What you experience and what you observe. And then you select said data that you feel is relevant and discard others that don't fit that story or that you don't feel is relevant to what you're trying to understand. You then add meaning based on what you feel is reasonable according to the data that you selected, right? So it's a laddered approach. You then make assumptions that, you know, based on any data that's, um, of any meaning, accurate, or represents your reality that reaffirms or confirms your decisions. You then draw conclusions based on your assumptions, based on what is best and what you care for. You then adopt beliefs based on those conclusions, and then you take action. And this happens every single moment of the day, right? And sometimes it serves us in many, many positive ways and others not so much when that bias is how we're adding the meaning through that filter, right? And so we do it without even realizing it. And we use, to, um, we use it to get from fact to a decision or an action, right? And so just with the whole interesting pie comment, right? How quick was everyone like, oh, she's not gonna like that because maybe someone one time said interesting and it was a negative comment where he had, could have had positive intent, right? So this is when I ask that 
you think about when you're making decisions, what was the genesis of that decision? Where did it come from? How is it triggered? And how are you adding, adding this laddering up inference to how you came to that final action based on all of the different steps to get there? Okay. So we can go to the next slide. So if you wanna think about a strategy regarding women and a gender bias potentially, here are 10 steps that you can consider um, to make women feel more included and have a sense of belonging, right? If there's, a, if there's a culture shift that needs to happen, if there needs to be more women in leadership or for more representation, women of color, right? You can understand the starting point so you can monitor progress. Of course, get a baseline. Where are you starting from? Can't measure deltas if you don't know where the starting point is. Educate your leaders, give them accountability for change, right? You can't empower someone else, but you can, you can create the environment and the culture for someone to feel empowered and to take ownership of those responsibilities, right? What is the business imperative? Change mindsets by challenging bias and sexism, right? Speaking up, speaking out, being an ally and an advocate. Be creative in job design. Remove any gendered language, right? If it's masculine fem or feminine sounding, how do we make it kind of asexual, right? Just going after what the prerequisites are for the role. And are those prerequisites truly necessary or are they just nice to have? Make flexible working a reality, right? We have to think differently about how people live their lives, especially given this last year, right? If you're creating, let's say, um, a bonus event for someone making a sales target, right? Are you only offering the, the opportunity at 7.30 in the morning on a Friday, right? So some group, some portion of the group may be able to attend. Whereas if it's a working mom, she may have to take her kids to school. And so you're not thinking through including everyone within how that final event actually plays out, right? Increase transparency, sponsor female talent, Demonstrate to women that you want to retain and develop them, right? Approach this like any other business improvement project and share learnings and good practices, okay? So these are some, sometimes they feel like commonplace or very straightforward, but times we need to call it out and say, what do we need to do differently, right? So we're gonna play this video. Do you wanna see if you can click on the video within the PDF? See if it works for you? It's about like eight minutes. Does it look like it plays? Beautiful, it should. Let's make sure we have sound. No sound. <laughs> Do you maybe want to have me try and play it? Go for it. Okay, let's, now I have to figure this out. <laughs> let's see here. Okay, do I need to remove spotlight? No, I shouldn't have to do that. Okay, share screen. Where do we go for that? Here we go. Share. Can you hear that? I would describe my political views as the new right. Yes, yes, but we cannot see the video now. Oh, you can't. We hear it, but we don't see it. You have to click on the video now. Okay. Feminism today. Can you see it now? is man hating no let's try this again so it's it's screen sharing you have to unshare the screen or click on the video okay so let's see let's try this again yay marta we're figuring this out can you, there see you go right now? Yes. okay can we hear I would yes no. okay. <laughs> as the news right i'll say that i'm left Feminism today is man hating. I would describe myself as a feminist 100%. Feminism today is man 
I don't believe that climate change exists. We're not taking enough action on climate change. And it's about time these people got off the high horse and started looking for credible problems that actually exist. It's absolutely critical that trans people have their own voice. That's not right. You can't, you know, you're, you're a man, be a man, or you're a female, be a female. Women do need to remember that we need you to have our children. Could I be friends with someone that says a woman's face is in the home? Um... Right, okay, well, I'm an expert at flat packs. If you have any trouble, just watch me. So it looks like I've got your instructions here. I think so. Let me help you. Let's just that bit there. Describe what it is like to be in five adjectives. Okay, frustrating. Dedicated. Opinionated. Lucky. Ambitious, offensive, solemn. Have ups and downs. Strong. I want to say attacked, misunderstood. Name three things you and I have in common. We're both male, we're both confident, and we're both loudly spoken. We know each other better than people who've known each other for 10 minutes should. You seem quite ambitious and positive, and you've got this really, um, got a glow. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Your aura's pretty cool. I'm sensing. Are you, uh, former military or something? People have said that, but there is no, really? there is no history. So are you then? Ex. Ex-military? Um, yeah. If you're ex-military, I'm very proud of you already. Well, so. I grew up, uh, in a bit of a rough state. I've experienced homelessness. I've known what it's like to have absolutely nothing. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm... Definitely most grateful just just for life. We've only just met, but I think you're the sort of person that would listen to me and we'd have a discussion rather than, oh, yeah, you could hang out with, man. Let's go. Chance. Hey, you're right, mate. Fitter than a look. Perfect. Oh, yeah. There you go. Basically, I thought we just bought a bar. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Each take a bottle and place it on its corresponding markings on the bar. Attention, please now stand to watch a short film. Feminism today is definitely an excuse for misandry, man-hating. If somebody said to me that climate change is destroying the world, then I'd say that is total piffle. To transgender, it is very odd. We're not set up to understand or see things like that. I am a daughter. A wife. I am transgender. I feel like the battle for feminism definitely isn't done. The fight is never going to be over, if I'm honest with you. You now have a choice. You may go or you can stay and discuss your differences over a beer. I'm only joking. <laughs> you have me for a second then. Well, I'm having a drink. I'm having a drink. Yeah. I want to discuss. Beer. Yeah, beer and discuss. Cheers. At the end of the day, mate. I'm, I'm reaching out to people, you. yeah. And, you know, even if you wanted to convince people about your point, the productive thing to do would be to sit it's down engage. and have a beer. engage. I've been brought up in a way where everything's black and white. But life isn't black and white. Yeah, I'm just me. Yeah. <laughs> Smash the patriarchy. <laughs> I'll give you my mobile number, you give me yours, mm -hmm. and we'll keep in touch. I'd have to tell my girlfriend that I'll be texting another girl. <laughs> she might get upset. <laughs> I'll have to tell my girl that she's gonna up. Okay. So, thoughts around that video. I know we're getting closer to the end, but I can get back to where we were, hopefully. No. Things open. Sorry, guys. Just imagine all of our dreams coming true. Just imagine everything that we're gonna do. Do you have a different video?
I think I got all my other windows closed so that we just have this one open. <laughs> oh, goodness. We're doing fine. <laughs> You're muted, just so you know, Samantha. Okay, I found it. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. <laughs> oh, let's do that. Okay, let's open where we were. Okay. So I can take over now. <laughs> Perfect. I think you're about to share some action steps, right? Some implicit yes, bias. There we go. There. Yeah. So can you see my screen now? Mm-hmm. Okay, perfect. So one thing that we can do, and I recommend that you do, and I think was also an action item um, that was noodled around from the last session prior um, a while ago uh, on bias, was doing some bias assessments. They're totally free. Harvard has put these out um, through this Project Implicit website. There's a listing of at least 10 that you can try. And it gives you a percentage of what your bias is relative to said category. So it could be regarding sexuality, weapons, um, you know, skin, um, disabilities, age, all of that, right? And, it's, and it, it's a very kind of quick example to allow you to understand your attitudes and your stereotypes or your bias certain towards a certain category, right? So that'd be one action step I'd recommend you considering to take going forward. The next slide would be, again, what's next for you? Those implicit, uh, those implicit bias assessments that you can consider, when's, which ones intrigue you? Which ones do you have kind of an affinity for? Like, do I have a bias here? Or pick one that you think you don't have a bias with at all and see if there's something that strikes you kind of strikes a chord. Um, review, reflect, and apply that ladder of inference that we had talked about. Like when you make a, a decision or you choose to react, what were those steps that you took to get to that certain um, point that you, that you made a decision that you took said action, right? And then share your learnings with at least two other people from um, beyond in your network and to your family and your friends beyond today. Pay it forward. What were some of those key takeaways, some of those big ahas from our time together, from the comments? I saw the comments going like flurry and I couldn't read all of them. <laughs> um, but you know, what were some of those key takeaways? You're like, oh, I didn't think about that. Or, oh yes, I've seen that happen. How can you start to apply that in your own life and start to act with intentional purpose to mitigate said bias, right? We're not getting away or removing bias. Every single person on this planet has it, but it's how do we choose to move with positive intent and not letting said bias um, potentially evolve into prejudice that then revolves, evolves into racism and then oppression, right? So it's how do we address it knowingly enough that we can stop it before it gets to having a negative impact, right? And so then I would just open it up to the group for any questions that you may have that were coming up in the chat. And I have additional teaser questions too, if there aren't um, ones that we wanna discuss, but the floor now is to the group. I just wanna say thank you so much for um, being open to the discussion, for receiving this information and reflecting on possibly how this can operate within your own life and how you can take these learnings forward and start to apply them to becoming unconsciously competent in, in a way that bias can start to help create equity and equality for those that you work with, serve and know. So thank you so much everyone for your time and attention this evening. Open to questions. A huge thank you to Sam and to the Amigos for sponsoring this with the district tonight. Um, feel free to unmute and ask a question or ask it in the chat. We have a few minutes remaining and would certainly like to maximize the opportunity of having Sam with us. So if you have any questions, um, I love this. Never heard of halo or horn effect. So you want to share your big takeaway? That would be wonderful too. Please.
Was that for me, Alisa? Say that again, Rob. I didn't hear the question. I think that was Adrian. I was asking if you're talking to me. If you were talking to him, if that was a comment that you had called out from him, Rob. Oh, I thought I heard Rob starting to ask something and then my audio broke. No, on. that was Edwin. Oh, it was Edwin. Oh, okay. I thought I heard Rob. Sorry. Edwin, thank you. Great. Nice feedback in the chat. Wonderful. Anything Excellent. that you not agreed with, possibly. Open to that conversation. They're quiet. Ooh. Uh, I wonder if you would comment on the, uh, the phenomenon of uh, being asked to uh, explain or represent your, your subgroup, whether it's mm. you know, gay, trans, black, pink, mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. I get that quite often, actually. And sometimes you feel like the token of the group, right? And I, I can feel like my glasses are making a glare. Um, and you feel like the token because there isn't more representation to provide more of a diverse perspective, right? So I'll give as an example, the Hispanic and Latino demographic, right? It's not a monolith. There isn't just one culture. There are 28 to 34 different countries that self-identify as Hispanic or Latino, and it could also be based on the language that they speak, right? So in Portugal and Brazil, they don't identify as Hispanic because they don't speak Spanish, but they could be Latino, Latinx, or in like the Southwest of the United States, they're Chicano or Chicanx, right? The X being more inclusive, so you don't have to say Chicano or Chicana, right, for the male or female. <laughs> Um, gender, right? And, and it's really personal preference too. So a lot of times though, it's because you are seen as the one person because you are potentially the only person to provide that perspective, right? And so that's when it's, it behooves you <laughs> to bring more representation in, not just for the diversity, right? Not just for the numbers, right? And you can check a box and we're done, but it's really about creating then the next step of inclusion where the multitude of voices can help provide that perspective, can provide that lived experience um, as a sense of understanding, right? Because my experience as a Peruvian American woman, having been born and raised here, where 90% of my Peruvian side still in Peru, I didn't have the insulation of the Hispanic family like a lot of my friends might. So their, res their, their response would be very, very different than mine but I can't speak for all Peruvians because I'm one of however many, right? And I, my experience is my own unique one. And so whenever we ask, it's, it's anecdotal, it's not fact, it's right, it's perspective. And so I would say first, if someone's asking, well, give us your perspective, I would caveat that with understanding that it's your own unique perspective, your own re reaction experience. And then if you're looking for more of a broader multi, you know, multitudinal perspective, get more representation, get more um, diversity of, of perspective around that table to help inform decisions and ultimately experiences, if that helps. Bring someone with you to that table, help them speak for themselves, right? Provide opportunity and exposure. Oh, well, Sam, we have a question from Fasahea. Yes. How do you how do we deal with the decades and centuries of degeneration, degener certain groups, degenerating certain groups in this scenario? How about the government propagandists brainwashing a whole society to have herd mentality? Mm, yes, <laughs> that is a hefty question that I don't know if I have a couple minutes to answer. That's like generational questions to be answered. Um, I would say it's finding relationships and broadening perspective of where you get your information from, right? It's not necessarily that conformative bias, right? Where I only get my news from one place or I only have a certain group of people, right? Think if you look in your phone and just look at the last five people that you talk to, do they all look the same? Or do they, are they kind of more varied and diverse, right? That's step one. And that's one thing that you can start to think about differently about how to engage different people for perspective, right? 
if you want to like take on the government or you know try and dismantle herd mentality it's again how do you create more of those relationships to speak up about your own experience how can you create a sense of culture and community to to have that sense of trust and willingness to have that conversation right you can't have a conversation without someone willing to hear you and have the other end be receptive of learning something new potentially or hearing another perspective or experience and so i think it's it's continuing to want to have the conversation and it's knowing that we can all be bruised by bias and being able to speak up in the moment and ha- and create those sense of allies and advocates along the way and then it starts to move away from a herd mentality that could have a negative effect to one that takes responsibility regarding equity and equality of creating inclusion and space for community, if that helps. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, for sure. Any other thoughts? Mm-hmm. Any moments where you were re- recollecting on when you had a bias play out that you enacted or was enacted against you? Mm. Oh, yeah. I think we can all say yes to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It can always feel good, <laughs> right? And so it's, it starts with you, right? It starts with leading with your head and your heart, recognizing, oh, I'm sorry about these lenses. It's recognizing that we all have a place to play and it's all of our responsibility to start to recognize when we have privilege and we have opportunity to make change and create space for conversation. It takes every single one of us because every single one of us can either create the opportunity or dismantle it. And so we all need to lead with positive intent and give benefit of the doubt and not make decisions based just on bias. I think that the people are extremely in, in, in most corporate and, and organizational situations, extremely reluctant to be the first person to speak up and speak out. Mm-hmm. Um, that came out at uh, a session that I attended someplace else in, in the same vein recently. Um, maybe you would like to speak to that? Mm-hmm. I mean, being brave, I mean, you know, I, I know how hard it is to be brave uh, if, in many situations and you do too. Uh, I'm not saying that it's easy or right. that I haven't sometimes regretted it, but there you are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think it's, you know, and I'm going to use a, an analogy when, like for a startup, right? For a new technology that you come to a point kind of on this bell curve where the feeling of not doing it, the, the risk of not doing it, where you go compelled overruns the fear of, of doing it, right? And so I think we need to get to that point where we can't always just f- depend on the safety in numbers, but we can create... Um, like I'll give you an example. There's an organization called RILA, R-I-L-A, which is a, um, a group for those in the retail industry, right? So sharing best practices, compliance, so on and so forth. And there's a subgroup focused on diversity and inclusion. And so that's where you can kind of share your strategies, your insights, those levers that you pulled. And so that's where you can really learn about the opportunities of how do I create a safe space? How do we kind of cooperate while we're still in a competitive industry <laughs> about making change and making equitable opportunity because we're all trying to work in the same direction, right? It's not like, um, I always have to be the first one to do this, right? Because we need transformational change. We need to understand what we stand for and what we stand up for. They're not always the same things. And understanding our values and those business decisions that we make do they align with the customers that we want to keep and do they align with where we want to go as an organization based on our values and our principles right and so while it's it's hard to say i'm going to be the front runner i'm going to lead a transformational change sometimes the risk of not doing something would have a bigger hurt than of of um just kind of waiting for it to pass so that's where you have to have that balance of making the most informed decision and, and learning from it, right? And I wouldn't say that these decisions are you know, gonna cause the columns to crumble when you're always keeping the person centered to that decision. If you're keeping your employees, your communities, your clients centric to why you're doing what you're doing, you should never fail. 
or fail hard, right? But you always can learn from it and create that trust, that loyalty and that brand support through that experience. Well, thank you, Sam. I think that's a good spot for us to close the session tonight. So on behalf of the district and um, the Amigos, I just wanna thank everyone for joining us this evening. It was a pleasure to have you, Sam. We greatly appreciate it. Um, for those of you who may want to watch the session back, we did record it. And I just included a link to Rotary District 6270's YouTube channel. Subscribe to it. Anytime we add new content, you'll get notified. So within the week, the presenta presentation should be there to be viewed. So uh, I want to thank everyone. Uh, I know Brian as well as chair of the DEI task force. Um, and Marta and the Amigos organization. Just a big thank you to all of you for participating tonight and we wish you well. Thank you. Thank you, nice job. Everyone, you will have a great evening. <laughs>